All right, we are recording. We are very excited to see so many people and so many new faces. Thank you for coming. We are Twin Cities Co-Housing Network, an all-volunteer nonprofit whose mission is to educate the public about the benefits of co-housing. Our theme for 2022 is catalyzing co-housing in Minnesota. In a day or two, look for a follow-up email with links to this presentation and other important information. My name is Lee Pedersen. I will be your MC this evening. We're really excited to have our guest speaker tonight. And if time allows, before we close, we'll hear updates from local Minnesota co-housing groups. Welcome to Twin Cities Co-Housing Network's inaugural event in its Meet the Professionals series. The purpose of the series is to inspire collaboration between people interested in co-housing and Minnesota housing specialists by introducing them to co-housing professionals who can show them the way. Before I introduce tonight's special co-housing professional, I want to let you know we will be taking questions for the Q&A. Please submit them via chat to co-host Paul. TCCN welcomes Grace Kim, who is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. Her 2017 TED Talk on the power of the built environment of co-housing to reduce isolation and improve health and well-being has been viewed online over 3 million times. Since co-founding co the architectural firm Schemata Workshop in 2004, Grace's focus has been on multifamily housing with an emphasis on community. In those intervening years, she has become an international expert in co-housing, inspiring projects around the globe her common house design guide, along with the design of her own co-housing community, has served as a resource for many national and international projects. Grace resides at and is also co-founder of Capitol Hill Urban Co-Housing in Seattle, Washington. The project is innovative in many ways. Nine families living on 4,500 square feet of land. That's less than a tenth of an acre. A transit rich environment means no on site parking. A rooftop farm that provides fresh, organically grown produce for all families and neighborhood partners. And a rental model that promotes affordability in one of the highest priced cities in the United States. She will share her journey in co-housing and offer advice to those in Minnesota who are interested in catalyzing co-housing. She will talk about the positive impact co-housing can have on combating loneliness and on other long-term benefits. Grace and her professional partner and life partner, Mike, learned about co-housing from a Danish guest lecturer in the early 1990s while studying architecture in London. The concept captured their imagination. TCCN hopes that her talk will do the same for our audience. Welcome, Grace. Wow, that was such a lovely um, introduction. And I don't know where you <laughs> found and mined all that information, but thank you for such a war warm welcome. Um, I will start my sharing and I've given permission to my, my co-host to tell me if I'm sharing the wrong screen, but here we go. Um, okay, so um, 
I had a different title for this and I decided to, to call it um, co-housing a new American dream. I'm going to talk about all of the things that that Lee said that I was going to talk about, but I really want to frame it um, from the standpoint of what are we, what are we talking about when we talk about co-housing? So, um, and Lee did a great introduction. Um, Paul had suggested I just kind of flash this on the screen to give a little bit more background on myself, but I'm going to just dump right and jump right into things. So, um, this home represents for many people around the world the American dream. Um, it's a single family house with the yard and white picket fence. And here, a nuclear family can live independently and amass all of the trappings of American consumerism. And we've done a really great job at exporting this idea around the world. And this is the neighborhood of that American dream. Every family has their equally large home on a narrow lot um, with its own two car garage and a small patch of grass which means that every homeowner also needs their own lawnmower. This is the neighborhood where home is real estate transaction, where you attribute value um, to, to the certain brand of kitchen appliances or how luxurious your master bathroom is. Um, it's a place where you make decisions about your home remodels or future way of life based on your future resale value. And for some pioneering families around the country, around the globe actually, they've chosen a different model. Um, they've intentionally chosen to redefine the American dream. One in which that rejects the idea of home as simply commodity, but rather thinks of home as a place of security, of belonging, a place that provides support, and is concerned with your well being. And most importantly, home is a place where they are in community. So that transitions me to co housing. Um, co housing is an intentional neighborhood where people know and look after one another. Um, there's always a deep focus on community um, as well as a respect for individual privacy. And I get this question all the time. Um, every home is fully equipped with its own everything. So it's a, a standalone home like you would have where you would live today. Um, the benefit being, or the, the added bonus being that you have extensive, extensive common facilities um, where you might have community meals. And really the idea of co-housing comes from an, a, an, a desire, um, a wish to return to having a village. So recreating the village was the idea that the founders of co-housing in Denmark in the uh, early 60s had towards, um, th that was the vision that they were trying to achieve. There are many benefits um, of living in co-housing, but I'll just try to share a few. So in, living in co-housing means that everybody, regardless of your life stage, has meaning um, in day-to-day in, in -day life. Um, and I say that from the standpoint, American society is interesting that we're so defined by our occupation. Um, and I have well-respected and trusted colleagues that have retired and spent a year or two sort of floundering of self-identity because, you know, as they're serving on alongside me on the planning commission or on a different board, as they go around the room to introduce themselves, they don't know if they, they should say, I'm a retired planner, or I used to have this position at this company. Um, and they're, and, and one of my friends just flat out said, I'm retired. <laughs> and that was her, that was her sort of self uh, identification. Um, so in co-housing, whether you are retired or are at a younger age, um, regardless, you have a purpose, a, a role, a job in the community. Um, and because of that, there's strong community cohesion. Um, and I love that kids of all ages, um, little to, to uh, teenagers will have, relationships with adults that are not their family members. Um, Co-housing also minimizes social isolation. I could probably talk the whole time about that, but I won't. Um, and also I've seen that in co-housing people end up being more civically engaged, um, primarily because just stuff happens around them and it just is easy to start participating. Co-housing also supports many sustainable practices. Um, the, the simple ones um, are you know, reducing the number of car trips because you can uh, 
get rides, carpool together, but also somebody says, hey, I'm going to Costco or, you know, whatever, fill in the blank store. Um, and somebody says, oh, can you pick me up this or that? Um, and so a lot of those kinds of trips can be combined. Um, in co-housing, there tends to be more active sustainable strategies. So while on a single family home, somebody might have aspirations to have solar panels or um, install a wind turbine in their backyard. The reality is that cost or time or ability to get those things done, it doesn't happen. And in co-housing, there's one person that figures it out and 30 families, or in my case, nine families get to benefit from that um, effort. Uh, I will say there is an, an audacious amount of recycling that happens. Um, the photo in the bottom right was one of the co-housing communities I visited early, early on. And I was just so amazed that there was all of these bins with signs about what goes and where, and they were separating styrofoam and plastics and batteries. This was like 20 years ago. Um, I don't know if you have Bridwell in your area, but, but now in my community, we have a, a company locally and they have um, all sorts of uh, recycling of things like that. So we have a shelf and bins where we recycle those things. But to me, thinking about 20 years ago and that happening is, is pretty remarkable. But I see this in communities all over the world. Um, audacious amounts of recycling of things that you know most people are just putting into the landfill. Uh, there's a lot of interest in agriculture or um, farming, uh, however you wanna think about it, and also access to nature. And because of a lot of these, um, the physical things as well as the social connections, there is inherent resiliency in co-housing communities. And that is a really sustainable practice that is being discussed more um, as we start looking at a greater incidence of, well, obviously with global warming and sea level rise, but also um, with just changes in, in, um, in natural disasters, whether it be wildfires or uh, earthquakes or tornadoes, um, like you're anticipating there, or hailstorms that might be causing people to shelter. Co-housing also makes it easier to learn new things, whether it's you know, learning, to, learning how to play piano from one of your neighbors or uh, figuring out how to do something on your computer, um, also to share resources. Um, so whether it is a computer or a, a kitchen appliance or camping gear or whatever, it's really easy over dinner to just say, hey, I need it. My tent is broken and I need one for tomorrow. Who has one I could borrow? And instantly you have, you know, two or three people telling you that you could borrow their tent. Um, in co-housing, it's easier to find mentors. Um, people um, I'm often interested in my community when some child seeks out another adult that has um, an ability to teach them to, to knit or show them something that their parent might not necessarily um, be able to offer them. And likewise, opposite way of the adults going to the younger kids in the community of like, can you help me figure out my iPhone or can you help me figure out this thing? Um, and it's also easy to get help with chores or projects. So nobody likes to do weeding, but when you have co-housing, you have two or three neighbors to do weeding with and you can catch up and talk while you're doing those chores. Co-housing also makes it easier to do spontaneous things um, and, and to celebrate life, whether it's sharing a glass of wine, just very impromptu or spe uh, celebrating special events. Um, my favorite text message to get from my community is, there's cup cupcakes in the in the um, common house for Mikey's birthday um, or something like that. We often share um, and celebrate birthdays together. Um, it's also easy to be very um, uh, spontaneous for a, you know, an ad hoc rooftop dinner to occur um, or to become politically active. I mentioned earlier, the civic engagement was high. Um, it's really easy um, to, for people to join and participate in marches or um, to do things that are more um, political or um, involving democracy uh, when you have others around you to say, hey, I'm making signs, you wanna come with me? Or, hey, we're going to this march, you've never been? It's easy, let's do it together. Um, so lots of things like that uh, are just a lot easier. What does co-housing look like? Um, it looks like lots of things. And so I'll share with you, I, I always loved when I would do, um, tours of co-housing communities or when I talk to, to folks, you know, what, what's your favorite co-housing community or where, you know, where, what, um, what's the, the right size or what's the, I don't know, ideal location or whatever. There isn't one because there's hundreds and hundreds of co-housing communities around the world. Um, each one of them thinks they are in the perfect location or the perfect size, um, really because 
residents are self-selecting the community that they're attracted to, um, they're going to find the community that is as big or small as it is suited for them, or that's located in the country or in the city as, as um, is well suited for them. So there are going to be lots of different ones. So I'm just going to give you a quick snapshot of some in our country. So this is um, in um, the north, in the northeast part of our country. Um, it's Mosaic Commons in Berlin, Massachusetts. This is, I would say, sort of traditional co-housing in terms of a linear pedestrian path. All of the cars are at the periphery and the homes are clustered together in town, uh, duplexes or triplexes. Oops, went too fast. This one is um, similar in Vashon co-housing, a little bit closer to home for me um, in Washington. Uh, it is um, a collection of homes clustered around a central area. Um, they have quite a lot of property. You can see those trees surrounding them. They also have a, a number of acres of farmland that they farm together. Um, and they have much more of a, a Northwest um, appearance to their home. In Boulder, Colorado, where it's sunny 200 plus days a year, um, they have a community called Silver Sage, which is actually uh, an elder community right across the street from um, Wild Sage, which is actually a, a multi-generational community. Um, this is, even though it is more suburban um, in its setting, it's much more compact. You can see um, the homes just in, around this um, open space are the homes of the co-housing community, but then like this building across the way here, the yellow one or the one right underneath this, um, the, the title slide, um, those are homes that are in the greater neighborhood of the, um, the, Hollywood, um, the Hollywood neighborhood, which used to be a big drive-in and now is home to hundreds and hundreds of different families, including this 15 unit co-housing community. N Street co-housing is an example of a retrofit community. So I love the story of this one. This one is in Davis, California. Um, a couple of families decided that they would tear down the, the, the um, fences in their backyards. These red dotted lines represent the property boundaries. And one by one, they started taking down their, their fences and, they would, um, and the rule was, if you want to be part of the community, you need to provide some community amenities. So um, over time, all of the fences came down this is what the site plan looks like. So there were gardens, barbecues, hot tubs. Um, I think there's a trampoline somewhere, beehives, all of these things. And then the last house that was sold um, was purchased as the common house. Um, and so if you can imagine a suburban neighborhood that might look like this, and thank you to get the images for this image, um, but everybody has their little backyard with their, you know, their grass and their, their dog, poor little dog being, trapped in the, the backyard there. Um, and it's pretty um, placeless, right? How many people can you imagine hanging out in this backyard? I don't know, maybe some, maybe once a year. Um, but N Street has the ability to walk through a very large area, enjoy open space and smaller scaled spaces. Um, the kids can run free um, and it's quite, a a much more lovely experience of a, of a suburban neighborhood. Um, this is another retrofit community. Um, and I'm realizing maybe you're seeing, okay, yep, a retrofit community. Um, and this community took, uh, instead of single family homes, took an office building um, and cut out a courtyard in the center of it. So what you see here as walkways, this was part of the interior of the space at one time. Um, they retrofitted with walkways internal, uh, inter external to the units, and then the homes are all facing um, into this courtyard space. Uh, it's a five-story um, five co-housing community with about 60, fam 60, 62 families. Keyside Village is in Vancouver, uh, Vancouver, BC, um, in a part of a, a Vancouver called Lonsdale, um, and it is uh, more of a mixed-use community in that there is a little uh, retail uh, commercial space on the ground level, um, and then the homes that are sort of pretty close to the street edge. Um, Daybreak co-housing in Portland is also a very urban community. This one has a large courtyard in the center and all of the buildings surround three uh, or face the, the three surrounding streets. So they go right up to the edge of the property. And then in Portland, another one, this one's also for elders. Um, is PDX Commons, and you can see um, this is a much more urban situation, even more so than Daybreak. 
um, and I think this might be my last example is in Durham, California, going back to the other side of the, of the country, um, an elder co-housing community that was built uh, maybe about four or five years ago um, and a much larger facility um, and, and larger homes, um, but 30 uh, families living in downtown Durham, North Carolina. So you can see there's quite a variety of, of what co-housing looks like. Um, my introduction to co-housing um, is goes back a ways. Um, as Lee mentioned, I learned about it in architecture school um, in 1992. Uh, we were studying in London and um, and just heard about co-housing at the time. I, I thought this was just another housing model, one of many that we were learning about. Um, and it was only later that I realized that was when it was first being introduced outside of, of Denmark and to other places. Um, I'm, I lived in Chicago from 1993 and 1999, and we had lots of interest in building community. And so when we moved back to Seattle, we, we sort of made a commitment to figuring out how we would uh, live in community. Um, all the while during that time, I was reading Communities Magazine and just trying to figure out how to, how to be connected. Um, there was a, a group in a forming co-housing group in, um, in the suburbs of Chicago. We weren't quite committed to living in the suburbs, but we tracked their progress and um, was sad to see that they did not build, but, um, but just was watching from afar. Um, and then in 2004, I went back to, um, to do a graduate degree program at Was University of Washington here in Seattle and went to Copenhagen um, and was able to study or research um, common houses. Um, and that's what I did for a, a couple of months, just went and visited as many co-housing communities as we could, um, documenting um, and talking with um, lots of residents, helping them prepare meals to really understand um, how the common house was used, um, stayed in co-housing co or in common houses around Denmark um, to see how they were used on the weekends and overnight, um, and really took from that uh, a, a large body of knowledge that then I've been sharing with other folks um, through the design guide that we mentioned, but also um, in, de in the design of co-housing communities that we've done for others. Um, so these are just a, no a number of communities that we've worked on over the years. Um, and a really interesting piece of that is how co-housing influences our work. We don't, our, as an architecture firm, we don't do 100% co-housing. Even Chuck Durrett had has said that, you know, he can't make a living only doing co-housing. Um, but our work in co-housing has really informed how we do work in other areas. So the participatory design process that most co-housing communities are accustomed to participating in is one that we actually introduce to all of our project types. And we um, think of that as a co-design process. So walking the talk. Um, I do live in a co-housing community, as Lee mentioned, and it is here in the heart of Seattle. You can see in the, in the image, downtown um, is not too far away. It's actually a 20 or, 20 or 25 minute walk, depending on how briskly you're walking and, and what part of downtown you're trying to get to. Um, and you can see just a block from our home is a very large um, uh, park um, that has you know, play fields as well as just open grass for entertainment and um, or enjoyment, as well as a playground for children. Um, and our walk store is very high. Uh, we have a light rail station just across the park, um, uh, lots of restaurants and grocery stores and um, coffee shops and you know whatever else you need uh, within minutes walk anywhere in the neighborhood really, um, including, I was gonna say, including um, hospitals where people are born and funeral homes, but the funeral home actually has moved and uh, closed and moved away, um, but everything else in between. Um, we live in this neighborhood. I live in this neighborhood with my husband and daughter. Um, and it is a very vibrant neighborhood with lots of uh, retail and night, nightlife and daytime life, life in general. Um, and we um, are, are fortunate to be able to, to live in such a vibrant and, and close in neighborhood. Um, this is what our building looks like um, from the air. Um, and the building, our building is just the, the light colored one, the, the grayish one with the yellow on the right. Um, we talked about this project for so many years that when the building on the left, which was started after ours and finished before ours, um, many of my friends were like, oh, I'm so excited. Your project is finished. And we're like, yeah, we haven't broken ground yet. That's just the next door neighbor. Um, 
but it is the same size um, and same um, footprint of our building. Uh, and it's interesting to me that in that building, there are 32 adults that live in very small micro apartments. There's, you know, a, a great number of, apart, uh, of kitchens and bathrooms in that building. And we have nine families living on ours um, in much more comfortable living quarters. Um, they're still compact um, and they're still very urban, um, but much more livable. And um, it really speaks to the long tenure. The building next to us is kind of a, uh, yeah, I, I won't go into it more, but it's it's a, it's a small apartment building um, intended for sort of short stay, short tenure, whereas ours is the opposite, um, intended for longer tenure. Um, the interesting thing about being on such a, uh, a vertical and urban site is unlike co-housing, this is a project that we did, but it helps describe sort of like the traditional sort of open sort of linear path, um, the linear path that you might find in a typical co-housing community um, with the parking, you know, coming from the parking area and all of the homes surrounding that. Um, we weren't able to do that, so we went vertically instead. So you can see the yellow is sort of a, uh, a figurative uh, pedestrian spine that takes you all the way up the building. Um, it is, in some cases, quite the literal color of the entryway, the, the, the courtyard, and, and that kind of space. Um, our floor plan looks kind of like, or not kind of, this is what our floor plans look like. We have three apartments for, per floor. Um, we have a single stair and an elevator that serves all of the floors. Um, and then where it says 21, I don't know what the 21 stands for, but when it went right there in the middle, it has um, a balcony that it, or a, uh, a walkway balcony corridor, whatever you want to call it, that's outdoors um, and very much intended so that we could see our neighbors, but that's not the next slide. So I'll talk about that in a second. So the homes are fairly standard um, for those that are new to the idea of co-housing. Co-housing is like any other uh, residential model. It can be um, single family homes, townhouses, duplexes, um, multi-story apartment buildings. Everybody has their own kitchen, dining room, living room, bathrooms, bedroom. I say this repeatedly because inevitably at the end of this talk, somebody will put in the chat, does everybody have their own kitchen or does everybody share their bathrooms? Um, so just to be clear, everybody does have their own private home. Um, and this is where I live with my family. Um, and the homes are stacked, but they're quite different. Um, so this is one of our neighbors. Um, they have a two bedroom or three bedroom home. Um, and our neighbor, Sheila and Spencer, who uh, have a two bedroom home. And actually their two bedroom home was converted to one bedroom because they took out the wall that separated the, the far bedroom from um, the living space. Um, they're just a couple. And so they took that wall out um, so they have a very long linear um, space. Uh, but the other families that live in their stack have two bedroom apartments. Um, this is what the building looks like in cutaway section view. So there are um, three, uh, or sorry, six families that live on the, the street side, the west facing side. And then there are three families that live on the, um, the alley facing side or the east side. And then those, the, the back stack is over the um, common house. Um, and then the, the thing that makes the building special is really our court, our courtyard. Um, it was intentionally designed so that the windows would face one another, um, that we would be able to see people coming and going from the balconies. Um, really important because since we don't have that uh, horizontal linear spine, pedestrian spine so that people could see you and, and that you might get co-housed on, um, we have that uh, vertically. So when people are coming and going, I see them um, coming and going from their unit. We can see who's um, here or who's looking around, looking lost, um, looking for, for their, their host. Um, and the balcony really supports a lot of community life. Um, when it's nice and sunny out, um, this is me, you know, I opened my doors and my neighbors were sitting out. So I, I popped, took a picture of them because um, it's very typical to see people hanging out and enjoying each other's company, even if it's for just five or 10 minutes. Um, and when I look across the way, Spencer, this is my neighbor, um, he is, you know, often in the morning making his breakfast, his smoothie around the time I'm making breakfast. So we wave. Um, if he's not there, I go through this mental thing of like, okay, are there lights on? Are they home and maybe just not up? Um, are they on a trip? Are they away? And if I don't, if all of the answers to those are no, then I make a mental note to myself. If I don't see them in a few hours, I'm going to go check on them. Um, so it's, it's for me, a really comforting thing to, to know my neighbors are around. Um, we have a 14 year old daughter, we can leave her at home for the weekend um, and know that if she has something that is 
you know, that it goes wrong, she can stand outside the door and yell for help and somebody will come to her aid or that she can just, you know, run upstairs or downstairs or across the, the balcony to, to get help with something. So it's um, very nice to have that connection and, and feel um, that somebody is looking after me, even if I, you know, haven't asked them to. When we look down from our balconies, this is what we see. Um, lots and lots of activity at all times of year, all times of the day. Um, it's not just kids, it's grownups and it's different combinations of grownups and kids. Um, and even when there's nobody in the courtyard um, after a snowstorm, we might have a little um, message left in the, in the snow um, from one of our neighbors. Um, and being in close proximity to our neighbors means that we can be present to one another in lots of lots of ways. And we enjoy spending time together, um, whether it's for impromptu things, um, you know, the, the upper left is actually not a community meal. It just turned out that everyone decided to bring their meal upstairs one night because it was nice. And so it became a community, a de facto community meal. Um, we have dinners together every other night, um, except on Saturdays. Um, so it works out really well for us. Um, and there's also always lots of impromptu, you know, get togethers. Spencer one day put a note on everybody's door saying, tomorrow morning, come and have scones with me before you go to work or school or wherever you're going. Um, so it's a, it's living in community gives us a chance to just share in the everyday's up, everyday ups and downs um, of, of life. Um, so who is seeking co-housing? This is a question that some of you might be thinking about in um, the Twin Cities. Um, I think of two major categories of people. Um, loneliness has been, and I said I wouldn't talk about this the whole time, but I'm going to talk about it a little. Um, loneliness, loneliness was the major pandemic before this coronavirus um, broke out a couple of years ago. It had been a growing pandemic. Um, and I say pandemic because it was an, an international issue. Um, it was growing over, it's been growing over the last decade and probably even more, but it's been studied a lot over the last decade. Um, and, you know, to the point where major magazines um, and international newspapers were writing about it. Um, lots and lots of stories in Asia about elders who were, um, who are feeling isolated, um, isolated and alone, even when they have family. So this, this um, the, the article on the right from Bloomberg Business Week was shocking to me that there were elderly women that were con committing petty theft, petty crimes to go to prison so that they could have meaning and um, community in their life. And these were not single you know, widowers. These were people that had families, um, but their families had, had taken them from granted and, and um, sort of pigeonholed them to, into one sort of identity um, that they were struggling to, to free themselves from. And so um, it was really interesting to see this article and really sad to think about not only in Japan, but where else in the world is this happening where people are not being seen for themselves. Um, in the UK, they um, recognized this need and actually in 2018 appointed a minister for loneliness. Um, they have an, a, a national program through all of the United Kingdom um, that is a campaign to end loneliness. So different strategies and different um, ways for people young and old to connect and find one another. Um, the AARP in the United States has been studying this for probably two decades at least. Um, they have had lots of focus groups, think tanks, um, studies that they have um, commissioned that have raised loneliness as one of the top seven issues that seniors in America face today. Um, and this is not just affecting seniors, it is affecting our youth in large numbers. Um, right before I did my TED talk, I think that the week before this article came out in the Boston Globe and it talked about um, how loneliness was the biggest threat for middle-aged men. Um, and it was interesting um, to, to read the article and, and um, about this, this reporter who had been given this task um, to write about this and was offended at first that why does my boss think that I'm the right person to write this article about loneliness? And as he did the research, he was like, oh, I'm actually the perfect candidate as a, a middle-aged man to be writing this article. Um, so I think it really points out the, the whole point that we could be sitting like in this cartoon illustration in the middle of a stadium full of people and feel lonely. It's not about um, who is about being alone. It's about how connected you are to the people that are around you. Um, the other group of folks that are interested in co-housing, you, you might all recognize this. 
um, this group of, of women are the Golden Girls. Um, and this was a popular TV show back in the 80s. Um, and I'm just noticing somebody must have a, their annotate um, function on because I see some things being uh, drawn on the screen. So if you can turn off the annotate feature, um, whoever that might be, I'd appreciate that. Um, so the Golden Girls um, had a TV show and talked about this lovely experience of you know older women growing old together um, and living together and supporting one another through difficult times of their lives. And this is the modern day version of that. Um, there are um, 20 plus women um, that about 10 years ago, or actually more than 10 years ago at this point, in 2009 is when I met Maria. Um, they started a group called the Older Women's Co-Housing Group. Um, and they have a different name now. I think their community is called Common Ground, but they just finished construction a few years ago and they were so ecstatic. Um, older women trying to figure out, older women that never had children, trying to figure out how are we gonna look after ourselves um, and take care of, of each other as we grow old. Um, senior co-housing is an idea that is growing in the US. Um, there are lots of people that, that say, oh, when my husband's die, my girlfriends and I are just gonna all live together. It's like, why wait for your husbands to die? Like, why not do this now together so that as you're going through that process of people dying off, that you could support one another. Um, so there is um, a lot of interest in the senior community. Um, there are more and more senior co-housing communities that are being formed and built in the US. And I always say that even the communities that are not intentionally seniors, um, I say this about our community, if you move into a multi-generational community in 10 or 20 years, you will be senior co-housing because believe it or not, we're all aging every day. So um, I will say that co-housing, living in co-housing for me is my retirement plan. It's something that my husband and I started talking about um, almost 20 years ago. Um, we were proactive about it in, in, active, in, in making um, conscious efforts um, probably over the last decade of buying the property and you know working on things to, to forward that. But it was something that we did in our 30s, in our early 30s, because we knew that we wanted to have a system in place. And it's not an easy thing to build co-housing. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, and it's not a thing that you do when you are infirm or need help. It's a thing that you wanna do when you're um, healthy and able to enjoy all of the benefits from it. And you will have that social network when you need it. So let's see the next. Okay, so I'm um, getting towards the end. Um, the advice that I would have for um, folks in the Twin Cities um, about how to make co-housing more frequent or how to you know, continue to catalyze um, interest. I've got just a list of things that I, that I have for you. So I would say one of the biggest thing is to eat together. So uh, host dinners and whether you do it with your immediate neighbors or whether you do it through a meetup site, just eat together and do it consistently and frequently. Um, when I was doing, uh, in 2017, uh, there was a, a, an ad campaign for a, a company called, um, well, it doesn't matter. It's a, a Canadian grocery store. And they did a, a, um, a, a campaign, a social media campaign, and they created a beautiful video. Um, and if you search for it, just search the hashtag, um, hashtag eat together. Um, it's President's Choice is the company. Um, and they did this video and you, you don't even know who the video or the commercial is about until you get to the very end. Um, but it's about uh, a woman just being frustrated with social media and the lack of connection um, and coming home and her roommate barely look, not even looking up when she comes home. Um, and then them making dinner and eating it in their super narrow hallway. And as people would come home, they were like, what are these people doing in the hallway? Um, and just, you know, slowly, one by one, everybody from the floor is out, including the elderly man that doesn't talk to anybody and that the little girl kind of pulls out of his apartment. Um, and it's a wonderful reminder that you can make community anywhere and you can do that. And, and I mentioned this during my TED Talk and one of the women that was in the audience um, contacted me afterwards and said, I'm going to do this. And she kept texting me um, photos and notes um, for probably the summer um, afterwards of, she, she was like, I live in this apartment building. Nobody, I, you know, my daughter and I are isolated. I don't know my neighbors and I'm just gonna, but we have a rooftop garden. So I'm just gonna post every Thursday night, we're gonna have dinner and see who shows up. And she said the first night it was me and my daughter having 
dinner alone. But slowly, week after week, there would be more people that would join and different people that would join. So that frequently and consistently is helpful. Um, that's a way to build community, period. But that's a, an easy first step to building community in, in a way that might lead to conversations of, what if we lived this way every day? Or what if we lived in community together? Um, likewise, community gardening is a good way to do that. Um, there's a community, a retrofit community in East Lansing, Michigan called Genesee Commons. And their community was started similar to, to N Street Commons in that there were a few homes that decided, let's make this a co-housing community. And their physical site plan sort of grows amoeba-like because their, their thing is, if you want to garden with us and or that you that they that you must garden with together with them, and that you have to be four houses away from the nearest next neighbor. So as long as you have that physical proximity, you can join and be part of their community. And their whole premise is that they're going to dig up all of the um, driveway aprons in their suburban neighborhood, and they just garden together. Um, and it's a lot of gentrifiers, people that are you know newly moving into this neighborhood because you can you know. At the time, you could buy a house for under hundred thousand um, dollars, and there were funny stories from, from some of the founders of, you know, elder um, uh, black seniors who lived in the neighborhood for fifty years or more. They would be saying, they would be looking at these young um, white people and saying, "I don't know what you're all doing here, but <laughs> it's really interesting, and I want to join you." Um, so just that act of being together and being in community and sharing those kinds of experiences helps bring other people um, to you. Um, hosting talks like this, great way to get the word out because inevitably all of you that are here might go home or you know meet with a friend later this week and you'll say, I was at this talk and I heard about co-housing and you know this is what I heard or learned and it starts to just filter around. Um, and then you find people that you might be um, interested in talking with. Um, consistent participation in the great, greater community. And what I mean by that is sort of like the frequent dinners of if you do something consistently, like you always go to a certain um, lecture series that the university might offer or um, the local theater group might um, have a per performances on a, on a seasonal basis that you might attend. Um, going to those kinds of events and noticing, oh, I see that person every week when I come to this event, or I see you know, those, the same types of people. It's like, oh, that person that was in my yoga class is now at this theater thing. You end up finding people that are like-minded that might be interested in having um, a conversation around co-housing. Um, this is not a thing that I would do, but I will say this is very effective. Um, wearing co-housing gear. Um, I, we, there was a woman, a, fr a friend of everybody in co-housing named Joni Blank. And she used to wear a button that said, ask me about co-housing. Um, and there have since been um, hats made that say, you know, that say, ask me about co-housing or ask me about Bofeleskeba, which is like the, the poorly pronounced Danish word for, for co-housing. Um, and it's always a good conversation starter because if you're wearing a big button and it says that, people are like, what's co-housing? Um, and so it gets people talking um, and curious about what that is. Um, you can talk to or advocate with your, with your city, municipality, town about surplus lands. Um, I will tell you one of the greatest ways to attract people to a co-housing project is to have land. Um, it makes it really clear where you're talking about and what sort of urban or suburban location you mean when you actually have a piece of property that people can drive around and see and walk the neighborhood and, and imagine themselves living there. Um, you can also identify a developer who will work with you when you're ready. Um, the banks will require this, and sometimes developers might already have land, land that they have purchased and they're sort of land banking because they don't have the, a project in mind or they don't have the capital, uh, but they might be really interested to know, oh, you have a group of 30 people that want to build a, a essentially a condominium project or a townhouse project. We have land, and you know, if you're ready buyers, then we'll work with you. So identifying developers that, um, that you might want to work with um, is a great thing to do in advance. Okay, wrapping up, a couple of resources. So um, this is a link, uh, or these, these are some uh, resources that you can look at. Um, the TED Talk that was mentioned earlier, um, I've done some interviews. There is a great article about my co-housing community and some other things. Um, the last example is urban co-housing case studies that my friend Brian Bowen, who's another co-housing architect, um, has created. So lots of things if you just Google co-housing on the interweb. Um, the biggest resource probably in the clearinghouses for everything co-housing is cohousing.org. Um, there you can find a directory of communities in the US 
um, that directory is organized by state. And once you click on your state, you can see all of the communities forming and built um, and, and click, uh, links to their website. So instead of trying to hunt and search uh, one on one for each of these things, you can just go to the co-housing website to find that. Um, and I'll make a big plug now to end it um, for the National Co-Housing Conference that will happen in Madison, Wisconsin um, in August. Um, this is a, a packed few days, three days, um, and actually it could be a couple more days if you want to do the, the pre-conference tours and intensive workshops. Um, but it is a really great time to really immerse yourself in all things co-housing um, and see built examples, talk with people that live in community, meet other people that are seeking community. Um, it's always um, amazing to me when you, I show up at the conference and there'll be two people sitting next to each other. It's like, oh, I'm from Tennessee, I'm from Tennessee. They don't know each other and they found themselves at this national conference. Um, so it's always a great um, place to, to meet and be inspired um, with, with others from the co-housing world. So that is the end of my talk and hopefully I have left ample time for you all to ask answer question or ask questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful and informative presentation. And now Grace, Paul Wearwine, sorry, Paul, Paul That's Wearwine <laughs> has been monitoring the chat and is going to ask questions gleaned from the submissions. Well, um, Grace, uh, there's quite a variety of questions. I'll start with this one, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, how did your co-housing survive COVID? What else mm. has been a big stress on the group and how were these things resolved? Yeah, I could have probably, I, and I have done talks specifically on that. So I would say um, in, a, in an urban community, we had two, two ways that people could come in and out of the building. And when, as you all remember, when COVID first started, we didn't know how it was being transmitted. So everybody was freaked out. And I would say that our community, um, at first we were like, oh, we can manage this. We can do community meals. And after I think the second one, we were like, nope, this is not working. <laughs> Everyone was freaked out and we didn't know if we should space apart or if we should be together. Um, everybody had different levels of reading and um, anxiety and information. So we started, we said, okay, we're gonna stop the community meals, but we're gonna get together on Zoom twice a week. And, and just talk about things. And so you know, people would share uh, what they'd read, um, people would air their anxieties, people would um, you know, be on the flip side of not being anxious and saying, everybody chill out. Um, but, but in a way that was not judgmental, it was more, we would do rounds and just, you know, how is everybody feeling? Um, and people just sharing their, their, um, their experience and their story and what was happening. Um, that was all really great for one, sort of leveling the painting field of what people were reading and, and, and hearing from other people of what they were concerned about or not concerned about. It also let us organize ourselves to say, okay, twice a day, we're gonna wipe the building down top to bottom, all of the surfaces that get touched. Um, we did this for months, um, probably for almost a year um, in, in an effort to make sure everybody was safe. We had people of different ages, um, some that had um, compromised immune systems, and so we just wanted to make sure that everybody was safe. Um, and as you know, the pandemic wore on, we you know continued to do those things. We continued to be very cautious and safe, so that everybody feels comfortable. Um, we organized ourselves and um, figured out how to, uh, you know, the whole grocery store thing is is really a thing. So you know, somebody would say, "Go into the grocery store." Um, in 20 minutes and send me your list. And so people would say, I need these five things or you know, these four things. Um, and this would happen you know, several times a day. So people were getting, well, not several times, several times a week. Um, and so we really limited the number of people coming in and out of the building. We said nobody from the outside actually was gonna, was gonna be coming into the building. Um, we had lots of processes in place to make sure that um, the delivered people didn't make it past the front door. We, we had a table for them and snacks for them. Um, and said, please leave our packages here and we'll take care of it um, so that they wouldn't come to our front doors. Um, and then we also talked about sort of how people were doing with loneliness and, and feeling in isolation. Um, and we, um, there was one woman that specifically said, I am super isolated. Um, you know, the, the rest of you have at least one person in the house that you can talk to, can touch, you know, not through Zoom, but can physically touch and get a hug from. 
Um, and she said, and even though she had adult children that lived in the, very close by and would see, you know, a couple times a week, um, it wasn't enough. And so she said, I'm really feeling this, this effect. Um, so our family said, great, you can be part of our bubble and we'll do these things together on a regular basis. Um, she's still my workout buddy. I work out with her three times a week, at least, sometimes five. Um, and we do, and we worked out together all winter long um, in the courtyard outside um, just to, to keep fit and also for her to make sure that she had co constant contact. We also figured out ways to do meals together. So we stopped our, our formal sort of community meal program and we started what we called block dinners. So in groups of three to four families, we would eat outside. Um, and we're not quite as cold as you are in, in the Twin Cities, but um, there were, we were eating outside in, the, in 20 and 30 degree weather with our parkas and our hats and our blankets and our, you know, uh, heaters, heated vests, everything, whatever we had. Um, and so we would eat outside. We would sometimes have hot toddy parties outside um, and do dance parties outside. We just did everything outside for literally a year and a half. Um, and so we made do, we, we, we took good use of our balconies. We did lots of bingo nights, birthday, birthday um, song singing um, out of the balconies. Um, so lots of stuff happened and it was uh, it was really, really supportive. And I feel fortunate because we're in an urban situation that we were forced to, to do that sort of, that level of um, coordination. And when I, there were several national co-housing conferences that happened online over the last two years. And my question, whenever there was a breakout room would be like, what are you guys doing? You know, how are you guys doing during the pandemic? What's, what's happening? Um, and it was easy for some of the suburban com uh, communities where you parked your cars and walked to your ho houses for people to come and go and really not have to interact with one another. Um, and, I, and I saw the benefit of living in an urban community from that standpoint of, oh, that physical proximity really requires us to coordinate. And there was an extra level of care and um, consideration in our actions and our conversations um, as a result of that. So I think that we fared fairly well. It also helped that we had a beautiful rooftop so we could be outside and be safe. Thank you. Um, Annette uh, studied co-housing in Denmark also, and she said much of the issues surround the home ownership structure and funding sources. How does it work here in the US, especially interested in how to finance multi-generational co-housing? Uh, that is uh, similar to a question about are most co-housing resident owned? Do rentals work as well or is there not enough group buy-in? I assume that means if people are renting. Yeah, um, so I think those are all really interesting points to, to discuss. So I'll try to break it out and, and, and Paul, if I miss part of the, the question, please prompt me at the end. Sure. Um, I would say in the US, it tends to be that co-housing is a home ownership model. So everybody owns their single family house. Um, and Ours is quite different because um, we have um, a rental model um, and it's a, a, a sort of low equity, no equity, a rental model. Um, and I won't go into the details of that because that's a whole other talk in itself. Um, but I think one of the things about buy-in is that in the US we have this stigma around renters and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. We have this stigma that renters don't care and they're not invested. And therefore renters don't care and they're not invested. Um, the reality is that in co-housing, if you think about the premise of co-housing, people that live in co-housing have an intention to live in community and to be collaborative. So that overrides and supersedes that trope of renters don't care. Um, in our community, even though we are an apartment model where we don't own our homes, people take care of their homes and maintain their homes in the way that anybody else would if they owned their homes. Um, so we have, you know, I personally have just done a major, major renovation to our home. Um, and if you just looked at it from a rental standpoint, somebody would say, well, why would, why as a renter would you have invested that? It's because I don't think of myself as a renter. I think of myself as a resident in this co-housing community. And I plan to be there till I die. So I'm gonna invest in my home because it's the place that I'm gonna invest in um, and I wanna be comfortable in. Um, so in terms of um, the, the um, I think there is more, um, there is definitely a desire of people that are in, uh, in rental situations to want to live in co-housing. 
Um, we do not have great models for that. I have tried for decades to try to get our local affordable housing developers because that's a big part of my work is in affordable housing. Um, I've tried to desperately to recruit uh, developers um, to become developers of affordable housing. They always tell me all of the barriers for why they can't do it. So I'm really well versed in that. Um, and I think it's just, um, there's also a piece of the, the, the pie that um, co-housing is counter to the American dream. And so it's hard for, for people to imagine how this looks in a um, long tenure um, home, non-home ownership model. Um, but I think there, I, I, I know tons of people in the Seattle area, at least whenever they come on tours, they always ask if we have the question, first question is always, do you have openings? When, when, will, you know, when will we have an apartment available? We haven't had any turn, turnover in six years. And we keep saying maybe in 10 years, we'll figure out what that looks like um, for, for turnover to happen. And we keep saying 10 years because we don't know, nobody has had made any inclination that they want to move out. So we don't think this is a thing that's going to be happening anytime soon. Um, but we do know that lots of people that are, are of lower income or, or sort of um, younger folks that are growing in their professional um, and earning capacity um, and that are very attracted to the model. And so, you know, one of the things I hope as part of this is maybe somewhere out there amongst the participants is a uh, co-housing developer or a nonprofit developer that thinks, hmm, how could we apply this co-housing model to um, the affordable housing rental model? Um, because there, there is definitely that need. I mean, all people need support and all people experience loneliness um, and those that have lower, uh, lesser resources, even more so, right? So, um, Paul, did I get all, all or much yeah, most of the question? I, th I think you, you did, uh, Grace, thank you. Um, uh, let me go to this one. Um, and you kind of touched on, on some of the, uh, I guess, the common values that you guys share there. What process did you use to find shared values and build commitments in your community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, every community, I think, goes through a process that's called vision and values, where, you know, there's a, a workshop that has a facilitator that comes usually um, to help them develop in a, um, develop a series of um, vision and value statements. Um, and I will say, for the, for the most part, they all kind of read similarly. Um, I remember reading from a website one day to my husband out loud, I said, and I read through it, and he's like, is that our vision statement? I'm like, no, that's not, but it sounds a lot like it. Um, I think lots of co-housers have similar values. Um, it doesn't mean that we have the same political affiliation. It doesn't mean that we are of the same religion or have a same, same belief system in all, all areas. But I think there are some core fundamental things. I think when you are thinking about living in community and um, collaborating, it just tends to, to, to you know, result in similar types of values about sustainability and living lightly on the earth, um, about equity and, and inclusion. Um, the equity and inclusion piece, I will say, rarely gets included. I am by far one of the few and only BIPOC um, uh, spokespeople for uh, co-housing um, or that even live in co-housing. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, um, there are sort of typical values that do come up. Um, affordability is also one of those that most people um, desire affordability. Um, and everybody has different definitions of what that means. Is it affordable to you and me? Or is it affordable um, or attainable? Or is it a federally um, designated income level that means that it's affordable? Um, so all sorts of things like that. Um, the processes, uh, the process people use to develop their values and ideas um, usually in co-housing tends to be con consensus, though more and more these days, people are moving to a model that's called sociocracy, regardless of what method is used or what for flavor. Um, it's, it's all about collaborative communication and collaborative governance, right? So the, the idea that there's a lot of discussion in co-housing about um, power dynamics and, or at least there should be, in, in a healthy community, there should be discussion about power dynamics and how does that play in, um, who has power and what perceived power and things like that. So um, those are all things to be thinking about. And I would say the successful groups, um, co-housing groups are the ones that pay attention and spend a lot of time and resource on facilitation and training. Um, it's, it's easy for folks, especially in the early days when there's not a whole lot of people and there's not a whole lot of money, 
um, for people to not want to spend money on facilitation and training because they feel like, oh, I'm just too impatient. We don't want to pay a thousand or two thousand dollars for a trainer to come to teach us about um, communication skills or about facilitating meetings um, because they're, you know, they're, they want to jump into design process or have a rendering to, to use for marketing. But really those processes, those that time spent in the training and workshops early on um, really pays dividends. When you get into design workshops and you're trying to make difficult decisions and you're trying to pay attention to power dynamics and who's speaking more loudly than others and more frequently than others, who has the money in the group and who does not, all of those things come into play. And if you're just, if you've never done any workshops, never had any practice in having those kinds of conversations, the design process is not the place to do those. I will say that having led many groups through that process um, and thinking that I could manage that, it's not, it's not successful for anybody. It, it happens all the time. And I will say that there's lots of relationships that are, are broken and, and hurt, feelings hurt because that work wasn't done ahead of time. And you make way better decisions, decisions that stick when you have those um, processes and those experiences of workshops in place. Thank you. Um, any suggestions on uh, books or uh, resources for uh, starting the community? Um, I will say go to Chuck Durrett's website. He's got lots of resources and books that you can buy. Um, That's the co-housing company? That is the, I think so. Neil, help me out. Yep. Yep. It's the co-housing oh, co company. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he has a number of booklets and things like that that you can buy for a variety of different topics. Um, there is sort of the co-housing handbook that Chris Scott Hansen wrote many years ago. There's, I think, a second edition that was published. Um, th those are some places. Um, and, and that works for people that learn by reading, right? Um, if you're not a learn by reading person, I will say going to the National Co-Housing Conference is, it is an investment. And it's also an amazing life-changing experience. Um, and it will be the start of what our, Neil knows, one of our um, uh, friends in co-housing um, used to say that co-housing is the longest, most expensive self-help program that you will ever embark upon. Um, <laughs> and it couldn't be more true, but um, I will say that for those that learn by doing and hearing and seeing, the National Co-Housing Conference is the place to actually really um, truly understand the breadth of what co-housing has to offer and what you're getting into if you want to start a community. I will also say that co-housing directory has that list of communities. They also have, the co-housing website also has um, classified ads. So the easier thing is to find a community that has a home for sale or a vacancy and move in. That will speed up your enjoyment of co-housing. Um, otherwise, you should be prepared for at least three years, but probably more realistically, five to seven years of process and design and construction before you get to enjoy the benefits of living in co-housing. Thank you. Um, Grace, there's a whole lot of questions about uh, finances and whatnot, but I'll just simply ask, uh, co-housing, is it more or less expensive than a similar living space that isn't co-housing? So I will say that um, co-housing is if you're thinking about purchase price uh, of a home, it's, it's on par with what you would find in the marketplace. Um, in some areas, it's actually even more expensive because co-housing in those areas might be more desirable. Um, and what you get for your money is not the same. So you can't say in my area, a 2000 square foot home costs X and in co-housing that same dollar amount results in the same square footage of home. That doesn't always happen. Um, and one of the reasons is that in co-housing, you have your home that you occupy and it might be a little smaller, like um, a one bedroom home in co-housing might be, not always, but might be smaller than the sort of surrounding market for, for one bedroom homes. But what you get in co-housing that you don't get in buying a single family home is you get a common house that might be three to 5,000 square feet or three to 7,000 square feet, depending on where you live. Um, it does, you know, a single family home does not include a lot of outdoor space. Like in some co-housing communities, depending on where you are, maybe not Minnesota, but they have swimming pools. Like that's the thing in California. It's shocking to me because we don't have swimming pools here, but in co-housing in California, almost everybody has a swimming pool. Um, 
So, you know, there's, there's different amenities that you have and it's all those collective things that you get in co-housing that, that I think make your home worth more. There's nothing that will, you know, the, Katie always, you know, rails on this. It's like, we need more comps. We need more comparables um, when people are buying homes. Um, there just are not enough comparables when the realtors and the banks go out to see, okay, how much do we appraise this house for? Um, so I would say buying a home is not cheaper, but living in community, I will say, is so much less expensive to live in community, meaning that okay, like all throughout the pandemic, there were two of us that had um, sort of second homes or vacation homes. Those homes were cycled through by everybody in the community multiple times. Nobody paid any money to do or do that. They, all they had to do was drive a car and usually a car that somebody else in the community lent to them because not everybody in our community owns a car. So that's a huge savings right there of just car, car ownership. Um, also, there are lots and lots of people that have tons of camping gear, tons of sewing equipment, tons of, you know, name whatever the thing you need. And so instead of everybody having to own it, people can just borrow it. Um, and it is pretty typical um, for people to be very living in community, to be very generous about, oh, sure, you can borrow my, you know, my uh, tricked out uh, camper van for the weekend, or you can borrow my super expensive ultralight tent and, and camping gear. Um, so um, yeah, it, it, I think just on a daily living basis, um, there's a lot of um, benefit and cost efficiency. Thank you. Um, there seems to be certain parts of the country where co housing has really taken off. And um, the upper Midwest uh, isn't one of those yet. Um, is there something in the water? Yeah. Oh, we have some background noise there. If someone could mute, please. So um, I guess, is there something um, about those areas that caused co housing to take off? And what would you advise us here if we want to make the ground more fertile? And I'll pair that with a question here. What would you say to a developer to encourage them to help create co-housing? They tell me they can't make any money at that scale and that, it, and that it takes too much time to work with a group of future residents. I don't disagree with that. And the benefit or the thing that you could tell the developer is I can also um, make sure that you're leased up or sold before you, you know, we finish construction. You don't have to do any of the marketing. You, we will take care of that. So that's like, if, you know, if they're going to develop on spec, on speculation, 30 or 50 homes, that's a risk that they have to take. When you are developing for co-housing, there are 30 families that will be waiting to move in the day that construction is completed. Right. So um, I think that's a, a, a risk piece that, um, developers don't think about and that co-housers should be really vocal about sharing. Mm -hmm. um, I also think from, a, from the standpoint of, um, of how to make it more fertile. So I will say one of the things about uh, the Twin Cities is that you have a major university with a major architecture school there. Um, and I know I saw Tom Fisher's name pop up on the, on the participant list at some point. So the so it, it tends to be the areas in the country where are, there are the most co-housing communities, coincidentally, there are also lots of, or there is usually a co-housing architect located in that city, right? So it's not a surprise that um, that's the, that California and specifically sort of the Bay Area has one of the greatest concentrations of co-housing communities in the US. That's because Katie McCammon and Chuck Durrett lived in that area and were, was able to help um, um, work with uh, a lot of those farming communities there. Um, there are a number of co-housing communities in Seattle. There are a number of communities in the Boulder area. There's a number of communities in um, the Massachusetts, sort of New England states area, um, and also in the DC area. That's because there are active working professionals working in those ge geograph geographies. So one of the things I would say is talk with the, the, the university, with the architecture program, get them to sponsor studios in, in co on co-housing. Um, I will say in my area, in Washington State, both WSU, Washington State University and University of Washington, they, both schools have um, at least one studio a year that is about housing, alternative housing, co-housing, um, and sometimes all of those things. 
Um, and my husband and I often are um, sort of jurors and uh, lecturers for those classes. Um, so that's why there's more people that are interested in, in there's quite a number of forming communities in our area. Um, so that's one way to seed the interest. Um, I think that if you um, could raise a bunch of money, I would, or maybe don't raise the money, do a slide presentation, get a bunch of developers in a room. There's organizations like the Urban Land Institute. Um, I don't know what uh, developers, um, there's probably another version or flavor in your area. I know we have some very local um, developer groups in Seattle um, and ask them to do a presentation um, at, the, at one of their lunchtime meetings or something like that. Um, and it could be a, a Zoom webinar um, or, or some other form and, um, and introduce them to the idea of co-housing. Um, I will say that I've done a number of talks for the Urban Land Institute in Seattle and in um, Oregon and also for the National Conference. So um, it is, that is the group to talk to because it's, it's usually developers that are working in urban situations that are looking at um, the, the future trends and how to, how to encourage density in a, per, you know, a positive way, um, looking for ways to um, create community. So you'll, you'll probably find a like-minded developer in um, an organization like the Urban Land Institute. Great ideas, great ideas. Um, I would like you to bring it to your own practice, if you would please. What, uh, what has made it a delight to work with a group or what has made it really a pain? In other words, what makes for a good trusting working relationship between a co-housing core group and a professional like yourself? Um, that's a great question. I'll, I'll share it. So I, I, I mentioned one earlier. It's, it's very difficult to work with groups that have not seen the, or realized the, the benefit and importance of um, doing the group process work early on. Um, I will say that that's always a recipe for disaster. I always warn groups ahead of time. They never listen to me. And then we you know, have a big thing, a big brouhaha in the middle of the design process. And it's usually the architect's fault. It's, you know, it, oftentimes the architects get thrown under the bus because like, oh, it must be because they're making us make these difficult decisions and they're doing their job wrong. <laughs> well, or maybe it's because every group goes through these processes. Um, there's, uh, I, I'm sure folks have heard this before. Um, there's a, a, a fellow that developed this um, uh, concept about um, in, in, in group dynamics um, that talks about forming, st forming, storing, norming and performing. And it's sort of a cycle that happens. Um, and lots of times people think, oh, it's a, it's a single cycle. You just go through the cycle once. And actually it's not. It is a cycle that is dynamic. So you are a forming group. And if that's, that's the same number of people stay together, then you might complete the cycle and you might start over again. But in co-housing, as you're forming, that group is never static. So as soon as one person leaves the group, the group dynamic starts over again. Right. Once somebody enters the group, it starts over again. So there are times where you are waffling between forming and um, storming, like back and forth, back and forth, because people are jockeying for power. They're jockeying for you know different positions in the group. Even if people want to be egalitarian, even if people want to be equ equitable, these are the norms that our society has laid on top of us. And this is how we show up and, and behave when not pointed out to us that we could behave in a different way. Right. So. I will say that the group process stuff is, is huge. If, if, I, if I don't tell you, if you don't walk away with anything more, I would say don't start a forming co-housing community without doing and investing in new group process work. Um, and there are, there are group process folks that work nationally um, and there are lots of um, group process people that probably work in your local area. Just find people that um, are familiar with group process that are used to working for corporate firms or nonprofits and that, you know, that think about uh, communications and um, you don't even have to say consensus, but communications, collaborative um, governance, there's, there's lots of different things that you could be looking for. So that's one thing. Um, I will say that I, and along those lines, I will say that on a recent project, we um, decided to partner with a uh, process consultant, brought her on early and, and said, you're going to do the process stuff and I'm going to do the architecture stuff. Um, and she actually was part of a forming group that, that we designed a project for before. And so she saw what we did um, in that process and saw things that, you know, on the, on the backside and behind the scenes that I didn't see. 
Um, and and so, so she approached me on another project and said, what if I worked with you and here's how we could work together. It has been amazing. Um, really taking that, um, I always thought it was a benefit to wear both hats. I realized over time, and especially in working with, with this woman that um, wearing both hats was to my detriment. Like I yeah. said, we always got thrown under the bus um, for things that were, you know, may have been a small thing, like a minor thing that was easily solvable because the group dynamics were not working became a huge thing. Um, and so I have seen that over and over again with this community. And there's times where she will say, okay, so what, what is it you're really trying to get? Cause you're asking them to make this decision, but is this really a decision that they need to make or must make? And just reframing it in a way that is really relationship-based has been super helpful for the community um, as well as for our working relationship. And I think my favorite thing about working with co-housing groups is I love after co-housing is, you know, the, the, the construction happens and everybody moves in. I love going back for the first, for community meals, any community meal. I will, you know, sign me up anytime there's a community meal, I, I will be there. Um, and I love visiting communities, you know, multiple times over time um, because we think, you know, as architects, we don't have this big ego of like, it must be this way. Um, we think of the architecture that we provide as the armature for the community to do their stuff, right? To, to occupy their home and personalize it in a way that reflects them, to be able to live out their community life in a way that feels supported and that the architecture is actually helping and encouraging and fostering those kinds of interactions. Um, and I love seeing it and I love, you know, when people find out that, oh, you're the architect that designed this building. I moved in just a couple years ago and I love, you know, and they list all the things and thank you so much for thinking about these all ahead of time. And for me, it's like, I love hearing that and thank your neighbors. Your neighbors were the ones that made sure that those things happened. Um, so it's, it's really rewarding um, to, to go back and visit co-housing communities. Wow. Well, um, I think in some ways that's the perfect note to end on, Grace. Uh, uh, so many positive thoughts and so much great knowledge and wisdom that, that you've shared in answering these questions. Thank you. No problem. Glad to be here. Yes, thank, thank you. Beth. Thank you, Paul, for moderating the Q&A. This is the end of Grace's presentation. Let's give Grace our thanks and say goodbye with a wave at our cameras or hand reactions in the gallery view. Come on, guys. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. I will just mention that a number of people have noted the uh, bad weather that's kind of coming through the Twin Cities. So I'm just going to say there was comments in the chat about that. Okay. Yes, I'm in. Oops. <clears throat>